Welcome back to ATXG. I'm Ben Wodecki and I'm proud to be joined by Brian Tan from Brit. Brian, how's it going? Uh, everything's good. Wonderful. It's great to have you because we're having a really engaging conversation around AGI, artificial general intelligence, and artificial wisdom. Yes. Now, you said to me before we, we started filming that you're interested in artificial wisdom. Can you explain a little bit, brief as possible to our audience, what that concept is? Okay, so artificial wisdom is essentially very similar to AI, artificial intelligence, except that instead of focusing on intelligence, we focus on wisdom. And the reason why we want to do that is simply because wisdom deals with complexity, dynamism, and ambiguity. And essentially, if you look at the uh, problems that we face or the situations that we are trying to uh, advance and imp improve in, uh, a lot of it is complex. Uh, and AI, with that focus of a point estimate sort of uh, focus, uh, cannot really deal with that very well. So in order to deal with these uh, uh, situations, with these scenarios, we need to start looking at wisdom. So how did you come up with this approach in terms of, uh, it's, been, it's been documented before, <laughs> sadly it wasn't going by yourself, but it's, right. it's something that researchers are actively investigating. Right. What sparked your interest in this? Why did you go down the wisdom route? Okay, so uh, quite a number of years ago when I left the university, I was faculty at NTU, um, I felt that there was a lot of value to be created by integrating academia with industry. And I actually wanted to create a systematic way to, to, to obtain that value. And uh, I put it in a business setting. So looking at the life stage of a business from startup all the way to IPO and public listed company. And I started to develop, uh, you know, uh, new approaches and methods that would integrate these two, right? Best practice of industry uh, as, as well as uh, academic principles. And as I started to build built these, I, I realized that there was a pattern. Every time I built something new, there was a pattern, there was an approach to it. And I realized that it was a thinking approach. And after that, what I did was, uh, I started to focus on building that thinking approach, which I call the wisdom approach. So I've actually spent probably about seven, eight years to actually build this. So it's, 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 it's quite robust. So how does your kind of solution work in this space? Okay, so the idea here is um, you first need to look at the parameter set of AI. So I use AI as a base. Uh, and the parameter set of AI is very limiting simply because intelligence is very focused on application of specific knowledge into a specific area. And that knowledge cannot be translated into other areas. So it's very much like uh, a doctor will not be able to give you advice on law. A lawyer will not be able to give you advice on psychology, so on and so forth, right? Um, and I realized that that pattern, that thinking approach, which, uh, which I was focused on, essentially addressed that issue, simply because it was based on uh, tautological constructs or phenomenon. So in a, from a research perspective, tautological constructs are constructs that cannot be refuted. So I'll give you examples. Uh, constructs such as friction, equilibrium, uh, path dependency. These are constructs that cannot be refuted, right? They exist simply because they exist. Um, and if we can understand these constructs very well, we realize that not only do they exist, they exist in almost every situation that we encounter. So for example, if we are talking about a relationship, right? Uh, and you're trying to figure out if, you know, will this relationship work out? Is it a good relationship, right? We can look at the friction levels within that relationship. Uh, we can look at uh, the equilibrium of that relationship, right? And it's dynamic, so there's no one set answer, right? So there's no answer like it must be equal because in different societies, there can be different cultural conventions, so on and so forth. So upon realizing that, I realized that this mimic wisdom very much because what wisdom does is wisdom takes a uh, complex or an ambiguous scenario and it distills that scenario into an insight, right? And the insight 
is surprisingly malleable, fungible, right? You can apply that insight in almost every situation, uh, across time, across context. And for very complicated cases, you might require a couple of insights, you know, kind of con kind of bring them together in order to reach that wise decision, right? So what I did was essentially come up with a systematic manner um, to get this done. And it's, uh, it's actually pretty thorough because it goes to the extent of uh, making sure that the construct has construct uh, validity, has discriminant validity, that the construct is a construct that is dichotomous in nature. So it's, it's, all, it's all pretty proper. It's, yeah. it's a conversation that would span a lot longer than a 10 minute interview. And I think the, the main thing that I want to gather on this is because we spoke earlier and you said that uh, wisdom in your view is beyond AGI, right? Yes. Now, general intelligence from artificial standpoint is a long way off, frankly. There's a lot of research going on to try to get it to, to work. And there's been some, some really good uh, movements on that. There's some, some good language models from, from the likes of Meta uh, and, and NVIDIA and uh, OpenAI that are getting close, but are, are way off. In your view, okay. what makes wisdom more plausible in terms of coming to fruition sooner than AGI? Okay, so essentially we need to understand the base construct actually. So intelligence is complicated because, you know, there are many different kinds of intelligence, right? We can talk about spatial intelligence, uh, we can talk about IQ, uh, and then, of course, you can go into all kinds of intelligence like cultural intelligence, um, um, physical intelligence, right? Uh, where, you know, some people can do incredible things with their bodies and so forth. So intelligence is a very fragmented construct and we don't really exactly know what we're talking about when we say intelligence, like which, which facet are we talking about? AGI stems from a uh, construct in the research area that is known as GQ, or general quotient, right? And essentially, it's trying to figure out why some people can be smart in many different scenarios instead of just one. When we work on an intelligence construct, it's messy because we don't really know what exactly we're defining. Wisdom, on the other hand, uh, is both easier and much harder. Okay? So it's easier in the sense that um, it is one construct by itself. We don't need to worry about the facets. We don't need to worry about um, are we talking about this wisdom, that wisdom. Uh, generally, wisdom can just be seen as kind of like a, um, the cognitive aspect of wisdom, the emotive aspect of wisdom, and some form of reflection, so reflective wisdom, right? But when we really look at it, emotion is kind of like something that comes and uh, messes up the thinking, right? And it's very difficult to deal and explain emotions. So when I talk about wisdom, I'm primarily talking about just the cognitive aspect of wisdom. Um, so with that, GQ or AGI becomes problematic because essentially it is a combination of many different focus of it of AI or intelligence right and even the AI feel is is difficult because the AI feel well AI is primarily focused on optimization and there are so many different methods right there's a method to deal with images there's method to deal with language uh, it could be optimization that is more geared towards uh, using statistical models so it's not a defined universal field. On the other hand, wisdom is. Because wisdom is based on universal truth. And that universal truth, even though there, there can be many different truths, they're all brought together through wisdom, right? So it's like if, uh, let me use an analogy. If I have two really smart people Right, but they have different backgrounds, you know, uh, different biases and all that, like what, like what people do. If they are brought together to solve a problem, and it's very likely that they will start to disagree with each other, and they will potentially argue and fight, right? And there is an English word in the dictionary that describes this, uh, called uh, 
outsmart, right? So, you know, I'm trying to outsmart you, you're trying to outsmart me because we are two in intelligent people. Now, let me ask you this. What happens if you have wise people coming together? They learn more? Yeah, they learn more. Not only that, there is no such word as a wise. <laughs> it doesn't exist. And if you start to answer the question, why doesn't the word outwise exist? It's because when wise people come together, they build on each other's arguments, right? They build on, on the ideas. So someone might say, well, you know, we need to take into consideration fiction. And the other individual will not try to outsmart fiction, but will essentially say, oh yeah, that's good. But we also need to take into consideration equilibrium. So as a result of that, it is possible to have a unified thought and approach towards wisdom that is very difficult to achieve in intelligence. So given the difficulty of this, and I'm conscious our audience have been bombarded with <laughs> very high in-depth conversations about this, what paradigm can they, you, they take away from this conversation in terms of applying wisdom to concepts and use cases within the next year or so? Well, uh, it's difficult when you put a timeline to it because there are a lot of obstacles. Uh, currently, I've developed this on my own. Um, I am facing my own obstacles because I can't divulge the details because of IP considerations and so forth. I need to raise funding in order to deal with the patenting aspect. Once I can get that done, then I can open up. So uh, if you want to put a time frame to it, it's very difficult, especially within a year, yeah. right? But I would say that I'm currently working on a project, a proof of concept project. It's an ethics chip project. And it's an informal uh, collaboration with a professor from one of the universities here, uh, SMU. And in this collaboration, what we're trying to do is to use the thinking approach uh, in order to build an ethics chip that will give computers the ability to make ethical judgment. And that's really something that AI currently, from my knowledge, is not able to do. And maybe if I just describe the methodology shortly, uh, you'll see that it is actually potentially much closer than AGI. Okay. So, ethics is something that is very difficult for a lot of people. But the difficulty really lies because we don't really know what ethical framework or concept to use. And on top of that, there's always that interpretation aspect, so on and so forth. But in reality, ethics is actually pretty easy. Okay? It's just complicated, but it's pretty easy. So let me illustrate. Um, you have all kinds of ethical concepts and frameworks. For example, uh, there's a framework of act utilitarianism, right? Uh, kind of seen as a, situ a scenario analysis where you're trying to achieve the greatest good for the most people. But you also have other frameworks like rule utilitarianism, uh, rights ethics, virtue ethics, feminist ethics, Kantian ethics, <laughs> libertarian ethics. There are, there are uh, quite a lot of ethical concepts and frameworks, maybe about 10 or so. What happens if you can actually take an ethical concept or framework and break it down? Break it down into its elemental components as well as the interaction aspect. And that gives us an elemental fingerprint. So I can have an elemental fingerprint for act utilitarianism, for rule utilitarian, utilitarianism, for virtue ethics, so on and so forth, right? That's my database of ethics, right? Then what happens if I can take a decision? And from the decision, I can also derive an elemental fingerprint, right? So I can, I can derive an elemental fingerprint. For example, in this decision, it takes into consideration friction. It takes into consideration time. It takes into consideration path dependency, right? And what happens if I can also get an elemental fingerprint for a scenario, okay? So given this scenario, you describe the scenario, you understand the scenario, you can say, okay, in this scenario, uh, we need to deal with friction. We need to deal with equilibrium. We need to deal with agenda. 
with intention, right? So now we have elemental fingerprint for the scenario, for the decision, and for the database of ethical concepts, right? And all of these can be done with the thinking approach that I developed. So now if I want to say, hmm, is this decision ethical? It's a, it's a question that can easily be answered because you can look at the, uh, the elemental fingerprint of the decision, map it with the database, and do a apples, you know, a comparison, right? And this is an apples to apples comparison because we are comparing it at an elemental level, which is kind of similar to the idea of the periodic table of elements, right? So we can do that. We can answer questions like, is this uh, decision ethical? If it is or isn't, right? What form of ethics does it rely on? We can answer questions like, um, what ethical concept is most relevant when dealing with this scenario, right? Because you can compare the scenario fingerprint with the ethical concept fingerprint. And you can answer questions like, uh, is this decision uh, a good decision for the scenario? Because you compare these two. So you can compare A and B, B and C, A and C, or A, B and C, in order to come up and answer questions that currently cannot be answered. Brian, I think, I feel like, I hope we haven't lost anyone in the audience because <laughs> this is such an engaging conversation, especially with regards to, you know, what the next step is for AI, or what the next step is to potentially reach that higher echelons of understanding, like you said, from mm. two to three, right? Yes. Really passing that threshold. Yeah. We're running out of time and I, I'd love it if you could summarize to our audience mm. just the importance you feel that gaining that level three would be for the, the wide population? Okay. Well, I think that we live in a complex world. And um, increasingly, we need to be able to make better decisions, right? Uh, as, as people, and potentially with the help of uh, machines or computers. Uh, there is an issue right now in that um, we don't know how computers think because we think differently. We, we think using generally a logic-oriented approach. Okay, I'm, I'm going to remove the emotional compound for now. But essentially, we, we like to utilize our cognitive, logical set of thinking. Machines, on the other hand, don't do that. This thinking approach is logic-oriented. So it can move AI from being data-centric to being logic-centric. Not only that, people and machine can actually start to really understand each other, meaning that you deal with the black box issue, uh, you deal with trustworthy AI, you deal with explainable AI, so all kinds of issues that are currently plaguing the industry. So if you can do that, you can potentially create brand new applications that currently do not exist. So already in my head, uh, I got three examples. One I mentioned about uh, the ethics chip, which can potentially give uh, computers' the ability to make ethical judgment. But my thinking approach can also break down complex constructs. So imagine if we can take a construct that currently we actually don't know very much about the construct specifically, and that is personality. So imagine if we can take personality and break it down to get an elemental blueprint to actually understand how personality works and what it actually is as a complex construct, not as many different observational characteristics of personality. Now, if we have that, we can actually create computers with real personality. I look forward to that day and then put it on a chip and sell it for millions. Brian, <laughs> we've run out of time and I appreciate that we've gone over so much. We can go over it more in detail at some other point, I hope so in the future. But thank you so much for your time. Thank oh, you. Thank you, Ben. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.